Well, good morning, church. Uh, we're ready to get into Genesis chapter 15. Make sure you've got your Bibles open and uh, you might want to have a finger in Genesis 15 and a finger in Romans chapter 4. We'll be having a look at both of those passages this morning. But let's, um, <clears throat> let's start by praying. Yeah. Father God, uh, we, we just thank you that you are a God who, who promises good things for us uh, and that these promises all come to fulfilment in Jesus. We thank you for what we've been learning in Genesis so far. And we ask, Father, that you would continue to teach us this morning as we look at Genesis chapter 15. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, there has been a, a theme of promises as we've looked through the book of Genesis. And, um, and that will continue again today. And I want to start by sharing with you a promise uh, that comes from the lips of Jesus. It's a promise that... Um, you're probably very familiar with, and, and sometimes that familiarity means that we do, it doesn't impact us perhaps the way, but I've, I've, been, I've been enjoying uh, thinking and listening to this promise uh, again. I was, I was, it was brought to my attention because I was uh, reading through this book. It's an excellent book. It's called Gentle and Lowly by a fellow by the name of Dane uh, Ortland. It's kind of like an extended reflection on this promise. And it comes from Matthew chapter 11, from the lips of Jesus. Let me read it to you. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Fantastic words, aren't they? Uh, these are... These are verses that perhaps, you know, we had them up on our fridge for a whole a long time. I don't think they're there uh, at the moment. I might put them back up there to think about them more. But what a great promise that Jesus says to come to him. And when we come to him, what we get is rest. And notice that there are only three requirements. You need to be weary, you need to be burdened, and you need to come. What do those words mean for you? What does that promise mean for you well, I think I know for me they resonate and I think for many of us they resonate I actually shared uh, that verse and and a passage uh, just a, a, a an unpacking of that verse uh, I shared it on my Facebook page and you know most things I share on Facebook don't really get much notice and I'm, I'm very fine with that I shared shared these words and and quite a lot of people can you know I had two likes um, no joking we had you know I, th I think it resonates with people and and that stands to reason these these are words from from Jesus but I think it resonates for a number of reasons one because I think many of us are weary and burdened and we crave rest and it reminds us that our rest comes from from Jesus I, I think it's it resonates with us because it's, it doesn't come with a set of requirements, some hoops to jump through. Lots of the things that we read and, and are sold uh, in, you know, for the better life, uh, do these five things and you will get, or uh, adopt these four practices and you get, or think these three powerful thoughts, or make these two changes and, and you will experience the better life. Uh, but, but that's not what Jesus says. He just says, come. So I think it resonates for those reasons. But I think it particularly resonates with us because it's a promise. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's a promise, and it comes from God, through the Son of God, through Jesus. You know, in, in the book of Matthew, uh, as you work through it, Jesus is being revealed as one who has the power to heal the sick, who has the power to to calm storms just with his words. He has the, the power to raise the dead. And it's this Jesus who speaks these words, which, which means it resonates all the more. Could this actually be true? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Now, there are lots of things that we could unpack about those verses. And we're actually, we'll come back to the promises in the gospel at the end. But here's what I want us to con consider this morning. When you hear one of those gospel promises of God, what effect does it have on you? Do you hear it with scepticism? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good, but what about? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's that verse, but what about? Do you hear it with a certain kind of scepticism? Or does it stir something in you? Does it, 
Does it stir something wholesome and good? Does it, does it lead to faith? I want to put to you that God's promises right through history, in the words of Scripture, God's promises are like sunshine and rain on the weak seedlings of faith. He gives us his promises to stir and grow faith in us so that we would come to him and believe. And what's staggering for me is that, that God deals with us this way. We really don't deserve him speaking to us and, and even giving us his promises. It's like the writer of the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2 saying, what, what, what are humans that you are mindful of them? What, what are people that you care for them? That's talking about God. And yet God stoops low. He, uh, he comes to us so that we can come to him. And we're going to see all of that in Genesis chapter 15 this morning. Uh, and the intended outcome, I take it, from Genesis chapter 15 is that we would come to trust God more. Now to get there, uh, we're actually going to go through four layers. Uh, we're going to go through four ways of looking at this story. We're going to look at it through the eyes of the story of Abraham. And then we're going to look at it as a story of Israel. And then we're going to look at it as a story that points us to Jesus. And then we're going to look at it as our story. But let's get into it. Uh, the story starts in chapter 15 with Abram worried. He's worried about something. And we know that he's worried about something because of what God says to him uh, in the middle part of uh, verse 1 there. God says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. So what we want to do is work out, well, why is he afraid? And so we're going to do a bit of detective work. Now, maybe it's simply that God is speaking to him. You know, every time that God speaks in the scriptures to humans, either God himself through a burning bush, through, uh, through an angel of the Lord, that the natural human response is that they're afraid. And one of the first things that God says or the angel says is, don't, don't be afraid. So, you know, is that why Abram, well, is that why Abram's afraid? It could be. But I think there's more going on than simply that. 15, chapter 15, verse 1 starts with two words, after this. And that leads us to think that everything that's connected in uh, 15 comes from what is before. So let's just quickly just recap chapter 12 to 14. In chapter 12, Abram uh, is told to leave his father's house, leave his father's land, uh, go to an unknown land. But God gives him a bunch of incredible promises, if you remember. He's going to give him land. He's going to make him into a great nation. He's going to give him a great name and he's going to bless him. And through him, he's going to bless all peoples, all nations. And the question that is there for Abram and for us as readers is, well, how's that going to happen? Abram wonders how it's going to happen and he ends up you know, taking matters into his own hands and makes a mess of it, but God intervenes. And so we finish chapter 12, not only with these promises, but with the reminder that if there's any hope, it's a hope that comes from God. It doesn't come from Abram or from us. Chapter 13, uh, we see Abram turning. We see signs of growing repentance and faith. Abram goes back to the land, uh, which God had shown him. Uh, and then we see him trusting God to be faithful to his promises. There's a bit of a problem with he and Lot, uh, but Abram kind of trusts God, allows Lot to go. And then at the end of chapter 13, we see Abram still in the land and God reaffirming his promises to him. But the question still remains, how's it going to work out? Chapter 14, we didn't look at it as a church, uh, although I think a number of you had a look at it in growth groups, uh, we, we have these kings from the north who come and they invade the land. Uh, in fact, they end up taking away Abram's nephew Lot and all of Lot's stuff and also some of the stuff of the kings of around in that place. And Abram acts to rescue God and that itself was a step of faith. He goes with such a small number of men and, and, uh, and, and God uh, and enables him to be able to get Lot uh, back and then he resists a deal with the king of Sodom, who is a, a wicked king. And at the end of chapter 14, we've got Abram meeting another king, the king of Salem. 
who is also a priest of the Lord God. Melchizedek is his name. And he blesses Abram. Again, just echoing this blessing that's been promised to him. So we've got three chapters. Here's the summary. Sorry, that was a bit long, but three chapters of promises and blessing. And in a sense, Abram doing his darndest to mess it all up. But God intervening and reaffirming his promises. So why is he worried? I think he's worried because Abram's just like you and me. He's prone to doubt. He's prone to worry and he's prone to fear. And he's, he's bugged by one question. When and how are the promises of God going to be fulfilled? Do you ever th- think those kinds of things? Perhaps I'll word it this way. If God is good and if he's faithful to his promises, why does he allow all this stuff to happen? Why does he allow the stuff that's happening to me happen? And when will he intervene? That's Abram's question. Have you ever asked that question? I know I have, often. Why is it a question for Abram? Well, he's getting old. Um, He doesn't have a kid. He doesn't have a child yet. And the land is not yet his. There's been threats from the kings from the north. He's nearly lost his nephew Lot. He nearly lost his wife. He nearly lost his life through his own stupidity. But the big thing is that he's getting old, and at this point he's probably around 85 years old or somewhere thereabouts, and he's wondering, when are you going to act? How are you going to act, God? And you can see that that's the question that's bugging him in, uh, by looking at verse 2. If you have a look at verse 2, Abram says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Now, we don't know who Eliezer is. It doesn't really matter. The point is that he's not Abram's child. But we do know that Abram's got a lot of gear. You know, he came out of Egypt with female donkeys and, uh, and camels and servants. You know, this is like you know, Ferraris and John Deere tractors and, you know, this is the cream of the cream. And the pressing for question for Abram is so human in a sense. It's a such an here and now kind of question. And, and that's not me looking down on him in any sense. We're, we're all so much the same. His pressing question is, who's going to get my stuff? Who will be my heir? And in particular, who will inherit the promises that God has given to me? And it's in the face of that that God says, don't be afraid. God's promises are there and they're clear. And he's, dem- he's demonstrated his faithfulness already. But Abram's vision is still very near to him. He, he doesn't quite see yet. Pretty familiar, isn't it? You know, we see this through the Bible a number of times. My mind goes to Mark's Gospel in chapter 8, where there's this really significant moment where Jesus heals a blind man, only the healing doesn't happen in one go. It happens in stages. Jesus touches the man's eyes, and at first he can see, but his vision is blurry. He can't make sense of what he's seeing. Jesus touches his eyes again and then they become clear. And the point being made in Mark's gospel there is that the disciples themselves couldn't see clearly. They couldn't see who Jesus was yet. They hadn't come to a place of knowing who he was and trusting. There was a further work that was to come. It's a great kind of parable of the disciples, of us. And we see it in Abram. Abram's seeing God, and yet he's still not seeing 100% clearly. What's striking when you look at this story in Genesis 15 is what Abram asks for in verse 2 is, it's almost blasphemous. It's, um, when I say blasphemous, it's kind of scandalous. It's, it's amazing that he, he dared ask what he did in verse 2 because of what God offered him in verse 1. Come with me back to verse 1. 
God of the Lord says to Abram, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your very great reward. What, what God offers Abram is so much more than the things that Abraham is thinking of at that point of time. God offers himself. He offers to be his shield. He offers to be his reward. But then look at what Abram says to God in verse 2. Yeah, good. Yeah, but what can you give me since I remain childless? Oh, mate, what else do you want, do you know? And yet, can you see yourself in that? God himself has offered himself to Abram. I am your shield. I am your reward. It's a staggering moment where the God of the universe is speaking to a man who he initiated a relationship with, this man who was a a pagan, idol-worshipping bloke uh, in chapter 12. And God invited him into a covenant relationship where it's, it's all win on the side of Abraham. And he speaks to assure him. He says, it's okay, mate. It's okay. I'm God. I've got you. And you get me. And that's the offer of the gospel, isn't it? You know, what does Jesus say? All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he goes, behold, I'm with you always. And what, what words did we start with? Jesus saying, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The good news of the Bible, the gospel message, is that God offers us himself. A relationship with the one who made us, who loves us, who offers to wipe away our sin and our rebellion and offer us himself. It's an incredible offer. And we know that at some level Abram gets this. In chapter 13 he calls on the name of the Lord a number of times. He values the relationship he has with God. He gets what's on offer, but at the same time, he's so human. He's so like us. Yeah, thanks. It's nice that I get you, but uh, I'm just wondering about this other stuff. I don't have any kids. Who's going to get my gear? God's so patient, isn't he? Put yourself in God's shoes for a minute. How would you respond? Would you be so patient? Uh, my daughter, the other day, she she had dinner with some friends uh, at a place, uh, a burger joint, and uh, there, were, there was this couple that were there, uh, obviously like a date. Uh, the girl uh, was dressed up. Uh, she was dressed up quite, you know, quite a lot. She had a nice red dress on. She was really pretty and, and so forth. And, uh, and so that made my, th- my daughter think, yeah, they were definitely on a date. Uh, but the guy, you know, she'd gone to some effort. She'd really put herself out there. But the guy, he's dressed in trackies and a hoodie, and he's spending the whole time that he's there on, on his device. And at one point, uh, my daughter said that uh, the others that she was with and herself caught eyes with this girl, and apparently you could tell that she really wasn't impressed with what was going on. That's how we respond to these kind of situations. When we put ourselves out there and the other party doesn't respond. But what about God? You know, one of the descriptions of God right throughout the Bible is that he is slow to anger and abounding in love. And we see that here. He assures Abram and reaffirms his promise. And in fact, he makes his promise more specific. Come with me to verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to him, that's Abram, this man will not be your heir, Eliezer will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So the Lord reaffirms his promise, but then he also gives more detail. You will have a son and he will be your heir. But having gone specific, then God goes big. And when I say big, I mean really, really big. Verse 5, God took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. 
boom. Do you know that moment? It just would have been huge, yeah? Not only are you going to have a son, but you are going to be the father of many people, many, many, many people. Do you have that experience where you go outside at night and you look up at the, scar, the stars? And it's, it's often just a really amazing experience. But imagine being told this, what the Lord says to Abram, such a huge promise, which just reaffirms and actually extends what was promised in chapter 12 and in chapter 13. How do you respond when you are told that? Well, it actually brings us to one of the most important verses in the Bible, a verse which is quoted many times and is alluded to even more, a verse which tells us how we're saved, it tells us how we're made right with God and how he wants us to respond to him. It's Genesis 15, verse 6. Have a look at it. Abram believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, credited it to him, Abram, as righteousness. How, how did he respond? Abram believed. The questions and the doubts and the fears which were chipping away at his trust in God were replaced by faith and belief in the light of God's promises which he didn't deserve. Abram believed. Now we're going to come back to that verse in a minute because it's so important. I just want to quickly track through the rest of the story. Verse 5, God had promised a nation. That was the, the people side of the promise. And then in verse 7, God comes back to reaffirm the other aspects of his promises from chapter 12 and 13. He says in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. So I'll give you a nation, but I will give you this land. I will bless you and, because all of this is bound up with the promises of chapter 12, I will bless all peoples through you. Again and again, God reaffirms this covenant and it's a covenant of undeserved grace and the response of Abram in verse 6 was spot on he he believed but do you remember that story um, in Mark's gospel again actually of of a man who approached Jesus to have his child healed and Jesus says I can heal him if you believe and and the man responds like we often respond I believe Lord help me to believe I think there's a good description of us and I think it's a good description of Abram because in verse 8, Abram's at it again. He, he's believed in verse 6, but then he's, he's back at it again. He asks the Lord what the Lord can give him so that he knows he will gain possession of this land. And again, God patiently stoops to Abram's level and he invites Abram into a ceremony which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us but would have made a whole lot of sense to him. Do you know today when we make a covenant, because that's what this ceremony is about, when we make a covenant we get a bit of paper or several bits of paper, often lots of paper, and we write lots of words on it about the details of the covenant and then we, we wiggle a pen on it. Now if, if we put that in front of Abram he just would have gone, what the heck is this? This means nothing. But uh, to us it means something. Well what Abram's doing what God asked Abram to do made a whole lot of sense to him. What, what, it, what he got him to do was to get a bunch of animals and to cut them in half and make a pathway in between the animals. And what used to happen when a covenant was made is they cut these animals in half with the pathway and the members of the covenant would then walk through in between these animals that were cut in half. And it was a very visual way, a very visceral way of saying, if we break this covenant, then that's what will happen to us. But the difference with this covenant that God instructed Abram to do was that it's a very one-sided covenant. Because Abram had cut up the animals, he'd arranged them like God had said, and then he fell asleep. And while he's asleep, God reveals to him that he will have offspring and they will take possession of the land, but not until there's been 400 years of slavery and then they'll take possession of the land. And then Abram sees a, a smoking pot and a flaming torch passing between these animals. 
You might be wondering, what, what the heck is going on there? Well, fire and smoke in the Bible represent the very presence of God. You know, you see on Mount Sinai that God spoke out of the fire and the smoke. You see when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt that the presence of God was with them in the, in the fire and the smoke. You see it in, in the arrangements in the tabernacle. God walks between these animals and it's demonstrating that God is making this covenant with Abram. And it's him saying to Abram, I will do what I have promised. And Abram understood that. So there's the story from the angle of Abram. But something to grab hold of is that this story was written down by Moses. And it was written down at a time when the nation of Israel was coming out of Egypt after those 400 years and they're heading towards the promised land. And a question we need to ask whenever we come to the Bible, a question we need to ask is how would the original hearers have understood this story and what effect would it have had? Well, if you know the story of the Exodus of the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt, you'll know that them coming out was incredible, but you'll also know that they wandered for a long time in the desert before taking possession of the land. Some of them went into the promised land, but they struggled to trust that God was going to give it to them. And Moses is writing this account, and it seems to me that he's reminding them at the same, not only did it actually happen, but he's reminding them that their forefather Abram once struggled with the same fear that they're struggling with. But God promised him, and he believed, and what was promised to him had so far happened. They were a great nation. Abram had had a kid. You are a great nation. You have received incredible blessing. They got all this stuff off the Egyptians and now they're heading towards the promised land. And so what was the desired effect? Trust God. Believe him. Believe in his promises. And so what it meant for the original hearers and the effect that it had for the original should be what happens for us today. Which brings us to the next layer. This story in Genesis 15 pulls together much more than the story of Israel. It reaches back to the very start of the Bible and extends all the way to the end of the Bible. And it finds its focus and its fulfillment in Jesus and in the cross. Now, there is so much I could point out to you. I had to chop out a whole lot that I had written down, but I just want to focus in on Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6. And uh, in, in verse 5, God promises offspring which will outnumber the stars. And Abram believes in verse 6 and God credits, credits it to him as righteousness. And I just want to unpack verse 6 first and then move to the book of Romans and see why this points us to Jesus. Have a look at verse 6. There are three key words or phrases in verse 6. Abram believes, God credits or counts it to Abram as righteousness. So believes, credits and righteousness. I just want to work through those words. We'll go in reverse order. Righteousness. What is righteousness? In the Bible, it's complete moral uprightness. It's to be seen as one who is without sinfulness. It's blameless in the sight of God. But we know Abram uh, didn't start his journey with God in righteousness and he hasn't, he hasn't done a particularly good job of tracking through uh, in righteousness either. His righteousness account, if you can think of it like a, like a bank account or a cup of water or something like that, his, his, his righteousness cup is not very full. His righteousness account is not very full, nor will it be. If you turn the page into the next chapter and the chapters beyond, we'll see Abram kind of keeps making a mess of things again and again. He keeps falling short of God's righteousness. And yet... We have here this statement that God sees him as righteous. God counts him as righteous. Why or how? 
How does he count him? Well, he counts him as righteousness. He credits it to him as righteousness. Abram is given a righteousness from God. The righteousness that Abram gets is an alien righteousness. That's how sometimes we talk of it, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that comes from outside of us, a righteousness that is imputed uh, upon him. In other words, the righteousness that's spoken of here doesn't come from him. It comes from God. God credits it to him. God clothes him, you could put it that way, with his righteousness, with God's righteousness, not with righteousness from Abram. Why does he do that? Because Abram believed. That word, believed, means to have faith, to trust. To believe, to have faith, to trust is the key that unlocks the door to God's righteousness being given to us. And that key comes to life, if you like, because of the work of the gospel promises of God. Abram heard God's words, he heard his promise, he believed. And God counted him, credited to him, uh, clothed him with his righteousness. And all of that means this, this wonderful truth. Friends, you can only be right with God uh, because of what he does for you. Or another way to put that is that there is only one way to be right with God. And it doesn't come from you. It comes from trust in what God has done and will do on your behalf. And that brings us to the New Testament. If you want to come with me to Romans chapter 4. Genesis 15 verse 6 that we've just unpacked is quoted word for word uh, four times in the New Testament. And it's alluded to a number of times more. And the point is made again and again that we take hold of the gospel promises of Jesus, of salvation, of forgiveness, of our sin being nailed to the cross and his righteousness being nailed to us, of us receiving himself. We receive all of that. We take hold of all of that by faith. The same faith that Abram had in Genesis 15. Have a look at Romans chapter 4 uh, verse 16. Just moving quickly through this, it says that if we have faith like Abram, we receive God's grace and we become one of Abram's offspring. We become his offspring, not because we're we're genetically related. We're not offspring according to the law. We we, We become his offspring because we share in his faith in the same God. So in verse 18, it says that if we have faith in Jesus, we become like one of those many stars that that God pointed out to Abram and said, so shall your offspring be. You and I, when we put our faith in Jesus, become one of those, those stars, if you like. And I say that this is all about Jesus because of what it says in verse 23. But let's just pick it up in verse 21 and we're going to just read our way through that. Verse 21, talking about Abram, he was being fully persuaded, that is, trusting in God, that God had the power to do what he had promised. And this is why, verse 22, it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but for also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness to, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, being made right with God. These are rich, rich words, eh? But putting the two accounts together, you can see that God entered into a covenant with Abram that promised many offspring and a land of true blessing. But for that covenant to be fulfilled, the righteousness of God, for the righteousness and the promises to be delivered, God's son became like one of those animals that Abram saw God moving between. 
God fulfills his covenant through Jesus, through his death on the cross and him being raised to life. And it comes to us by us listening to the call to have the same faith as Abram. Friends, I'd love to chase down more of those connections between Genesis 15 and Jesus and the New Testament. I'd encourage you perhaps, you know, uh, during the week, uh, chase down those times that Genesis 15 verse 6 is quoted elsewhere in the Bible. Just prayerfully ponder what it means. But I can tell you one thing it does mean. You are not made right with God by how good you are. You're not made right with God by how effective you are, how popular you are, how respected you are. And you're not made unable to be right with God by being the opposite of any of those things. You are only made right with God by trusting in his saviour Jesus and all that he has done. And that brings us to our story. Do you know if you belong to God? Do you know yourself to be someone who is forgiven, clothed with his righteousness, having received Christ as your shield and as your great reward? Well, if you're unsure, then let me just say to you this. Don't trust in your own ability to make yourself right with God. You know, I don't reckon you or I are any better than Abram. And you can see that he had issues. And so what we need to do is what he did, and that is to trust in God. Receive his appointed saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust that what God promises is true. Forgiveness of sin the gift of his spirit and the new creation to come. So can I encourage you to do business with God today? Maybe you might want to go out under the stars tonight. Hopefully there's some stars and talk with him. You've seen how patient he is through this story of Abram in Genesis 15. You've seen how willing he is to meet us where we're at. So can I encourage you to turn to him in faith? Trust him today. You won't regret it. Many of us, though, we, we know that we belong to God. We've believed in God and we know that he has given us his righteousness and that is a great joy. But nevertheless, we see many elements of Abram in our life, a faith that wobbles and a faith that fears. How does God respond to Abram at that time? He speaks his word and his promises to him. And those, his word and those promises stir faith in Abram. Now he has, and, and we have a very real responsibility in this. We need to listen. We need to listen to God's word. We need to listen to his promises and we need to exercise our faith we need to trust that what he says is true but can i encourage you to think of it this way that the promises of god are like sun and rain on weak seedlings of faith which means that we need to feed on his promises we need to write them down meditate on them think about them do you know, uh, next to our toilet, um, sorry, uh, we've got a little whiteboard and uh, we often write verses uh, on there, obviously when we've got clean hands, um, but uh, we, we write some of the promises of God and they're a great encouragement to us. So let me offer some gospel promises to you. Philippians 1 verse 6 is a great gospel promise. Uh, where the Apostle Paul says that we can be confident of this. We can be confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
Wow. How much hope does that give you? Gives me stacks of hope. And notice how it encourages us to put our hope in him and his work, not, not in our own. He who began a good work will bring it to completion. There's a great gospel promise for you. Well, what about this from uh, the letter of John, 1 John 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it, do, it did not know him. Dear friends, now, right now, we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. There's a promise. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So how are you going with trusting in God's gospel promises through Jesus? Maybe you feel like you're not going so well with it. Well then, listen to the words of Jesus. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let's pray, huh? Father, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you that you, you've made promises to us and you keep reminding us of those promises and you bring those promises to life in us by a work of your Spirit. And we just want to thank you and praise you and worship you because you are a God that is slow to anger and abounding in love. Lord, you are awesome. We pray, Father, that you would continue to be kind and patient with us and that you would keep growing us, that you would do what you promise, that you will bring to completion the work that you've begun in us, that we might bring honour and glory and praise to you. We pray this in your name. Amen.